Since announcing the new electric F-150 in May of 2021, Ford has doubled its market valuation and the F-150 Lightning's production capacity from 75,000 vehicles to 150,000 vehicles by 2023. Then in October of 2021, the world's largest carbon capture plant opened in Iceland, capable of extracting thousands of metric tons of carbon dioxide out of the air and storing it deep underground. In December of 2021, Commonwealth Fusion Systems announced it closed on more than $1.8 billion in Series B funding to commercialize fusion energy, one of the largest VC funding rounds in history. And as of January 2022, electric vehicle manufacturer Tesla was worth nearly $1 trillion, which is more than GM, Toyota, Ford, Volkswagen, BMW, Stellantis, Nissan, and Honda combined. As a matter of fact, since 2015, the climate tech sector counts 47 unicorns, or privately held startups valued at over $1 billion. But what is particularly important to note here is that over half of them joined the Unicorn Club in 2021 alone. Welcome to the IQT Podcast. On today's episode, we explore climate tech, what it is, why it's important, and how we can use it to help shape a better future for us all. I'm your host, Vishal Sandesera, and joining me on today's episode are two of my colleagues from InQtel, Victoria Chernow, who's a technology architect at IQT's field technologies team, worked as a fellow at ARPA-E before joining IQT, looking at innovations in next generation nuclear energy and engineered biology for energy and materials manufacture, among other areas. Also joining me is Steve Taub, a partner on our investments team. Steve is a recovering mechanical engineer and has worked in government and industry and has 10 years of experience as a corporate venture capitalist before joining IQT in 2019, where he now focuses on industrial technology, energy, advanced manufacturing, materials, aerospace, autonomous systems, among many other things. Welcome to you both. Thanks. So Great to be here. let's get started. Both of you have had the uh, exciting fortune of, of analyzing the space for quite some time. And in fact, you've uh, put together and, and have, have released a blog on the topic, which I'll encourage all of our, our uh, listeners to check out at the, uh, at the end of our show. Uh, but you've you've had some some time and energy to put into understanding the landscape, perhaps understanding the uh, both the importance and impetus uh, of climate tech in general. Why don't you take us through just a, an explanation of what this means, and if we've heard this before, or if this is a new concept? So yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, yeah, climate technology means so many things. Um, the UN has kind of put out this very uh, expansive definition that. Um, climate technology is any tool or equipment, technique, knowledge, skill that can be used to face climate change. So what doesn't that mean, right? Um, for our, you know, discussions, conceptualization of this space, uh, we, we kind of thought that uh, we would bucket climate technology into four different areas. Um, the first one uh, is observation and tracking. And this basically deals with assessing changes to climate systems, you know, things like sea level change, for example, um, also human induced factors of climate change, like emissions and pollution, and also physical, socioeconomic and political effects. So this is anything from natural disasters to human migration to, you know, human health, uh, supply chain, um, and, and more. And the technology for doing this, um, tracking is either in situ or remote sensing technology, as well as digital tracking. So anything from analytics, data fusion, visualization, and more. Um, the next big bucket that we want to call out is clean alternatives. And here we focus on sectors of the economy that produce emissions. And what are the technological options to decarbonize or electrify these sectors? So in clean alternatives, um, some of the major areas we characterize here include the transportation of goods and people, the way that we generate and store energy, and then the big, the big one, how we make things. And that obviously that's huge. Um, but now decarbonization and electrification uh, is not going to be possible without looking at the material supply chains that are necessary to move away from a fossil fuel based economy to a carbon neutral or negative one. And that's going to be an economy that runs on things like lithium and cobalt and copper, rare earth metals and, and more. And so uh, resources for the energy transition is another bucket that we have um, outlined. And this is something that focuses on mining and processing, recycling and the recovery of critical minerals. And finally, our, our last bucket is split between technologies that will 
one, help us adapt to life in a changing climate and reduce our vulnerability to the harmful effects of climate change, and also technologies that will reduce the flow of heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and hopefully you know, stabilize, if not completely reverse climate change. And so this is adaptation and mitigation, uh, respectively. So let me read that back to you just uh, on behalf of our listeners. We've, we've thought about climate technologies from, from four perspectives. There's the observation and tracking bucket. There's a clean alternatives bucket, a resources bucket. So a lot, a lot of the rare earth minerals that you talked about. And I think later in the show, we'll get into a little bit about uh, who's leading the charge there. And lastly, adaptation and mitigation. Um, when it comes to these four perspectives, how is this any different than, say, uh, some of our listeners might be familiar with the, con- the, the rise of what was referred to as clean tech, perhaps, uh, you know, o- over a decade ago. Uh, are these four buckets any different from from then? Are they are they better suited, perhaps, to be looked looked upon in in this new context that we're in? Any thoughts there? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Michelle, there, there, you know, as, as a lot of uh, our listeners may know, you know, about fifteen years ago, there was a really kind of a big burst of interest in what people at the time called clean tech, um, and a lot of the things that we're calling climate tech today, you know, fell into that that clean tech bucket, um, you know, that that people were were um, very enthusiastic about. Um, and we can talk more later about, you know, kind of what the, the history of that uh, was. But uh, I think what's changed this time around is that um, it's a much broader definition. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, people are focusing on today that were not really a big part of the clean tech um, boom that we had, you know, 15 years ago. So, you know, things like um, the food supply chain, for example, uh, or a lot of the, the um, kind of resources and materials that Ricky was talking about. Um, you know, weren't really a big focus of the conversation back then, and they're very much front and center these days. I see. And just as not to harp on on the past, but as a quick history lesson, perhaps if we look at, uh, if I if I very naively refer to uh, the first wave and sort of the current wave that we're in of of interest, uh, maybe some hype and also a lot of important R and D work being done here. What what do you say came out of the first wave, and how does it lend itself uh, to to the to what we're currently seeing? Um, yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, you know. So for listeners who weren't familiar with this, you know, as I said, there was a boom and bust in uh, what people call clean tech venture capital uh, about 15 years ago. Um, you know, you had a period um, with high oil and gas prices and um, a growing public awareness. So, you know, we, a lot of people probably remember the uh, Al Gore's movie and Inconvenient Truth that really raised public awareness of the issue. Um, a lot of investors who had made a lot of money in um uh, other sectors and, and were very idealistic and, you know, wanted to save the world. <laughs> uh, and then also, you know, uh, government support, both, uh, actual government support as well as the expectation of further government policies. You know, there, there was a lot of expectation that we were going to have a, a, a national cap and trade bill, for example, to, um, limit the emissions of greenhouse gases uh, with the new Obama administration. Um, you know, unfortunately that, that, um, bubble burst, uh, around 2010. You know, oil and gas prices declined, which I think anybody who had paid attention over the previous 50 or 60 years knew was inevitable. Um, there was a lot of overinvestment um, in some of these sectors that really kind of crashed the market prices and margins and uh, drove a lot of companies out of business. Um, and also, you know, the, the, the politics of this have continued to be uh, contentious and a lot of the, um, the more comprehensive policies didn't materialize um, and that really kind of undermined the, the sector. Um, so along with this boom and bust, there was a real spike in investment in uh, what people call clean tech companies. So, uh, you know, if you went back to the sort of early 2000s, um, you know, the, the level of investment activity in um, what today we would call climate technologies was, you know, maybe a few hundred million dollars a year. Um, but suddenly you know, there was a huge upswing and, and eventually, uh, you know, we had... Uh, about a five-year period where it was more like, you know, uh, three or four billion dollars a year. Um, and then, of course, it, it kind of came back down, although it didn't go all the way back down to where it had been. So it, it settled at a, you know, two or three times what it had been previous to the boom. Um, but, you know, venture investors lost a lot of money with some of these, um, some of these investments. Um, you know, these companies in the clean tech sector turned out to be more likely to fail than, you know, the, the software and, uh, healthcare technology companies that the venture capital business was really uh, focused on. Um, and even the ones that did succeed didn't yield as much of a return as the, the as these other sectors. So, you know, the sector really kind of lost favor uh, with a lot of venture investors. Um, but, um, you know, people, people learned some lessons from that. Um, 
in terms of where the, the best opportunities were, what the right business plans were. Um, they have more realistic expectations these days. And, you know, fundamentally, these markets have matured quite a lot um, in the last 15 years. Uh, maybe we can talk a little, more, a little more about that later. Yeah, I think that uh, I, everything you're saying, I, I remember the time uh, yeah, as, as sort of, a, again, a spectator at the time I was uh, still, still uh, completing my education, uh, my formal education at the time. But I, I, I seem to recall as I look back now, uh, I think one of the things, despite the boom and the bust, we certainly have gotten to a place where a lot of the uh, the few companies that did succeed and did really well competed with each other to drive costs down, improve on innovation. I, very simplistically stated, I, I see solar panels at, when I'm strolling through the neighborhoods in, in, in the Bay Area, for example. I, every home has some sort of like solar panel on their house or some sort of constellation of solar panels on their house. I, I tend to think that it overlaps well with the timing of sort of the post the post uh, boom and bust cycle. And so I, I suppose some players emerged, uh, and now we find ourselves in a position today where it strikes me that different problems are being different technologies are being um, being used or, or appointed to to solve somewhat more complex issues and more problems. And I look forward to, to how the, that analog plays out in this wave. Additionally, you mentioned cap and trade uh, in the first wave. I'm very, again, simplistically reminded of just sort of the build back better um, set of legislation that's sort of in, uh, in limbo at the current moment. Uh, and you'll see how that sort of lays the foundation and allows for an incubate, incubation environment for a lot of these entrepreneurs and investors. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, certainly there's a lot of commercial action going on in this space. Uh, but, but, you know, you both believe that this, and, and right, rightly so, as a lot of other nations do as well, that climate tech is actually a matter of national security concern. It is, it is actually very important from a government perspective uh, to think through and try to solve things uh, that are associated with, with uh, enormous greenhouse gas emissions, rising temperatures and whatnot. And I, we opened our podcast with a discussion of, of the dynamics of this market. I didn't want to focus on the doom and gloom, but... There is the the, uh, the sad truth to this matter that the, the planet is slowly getting warmer and warmer, and that's one that's just one of the many problems that a lot of these entrepreneurs and investors are trying to solve. Why should we consider this uh, a national security concern? Why is it important to to think of it that way? Yeah, no, that that's a great question. So, I mean, you know, climate change, you know, we think it really sits at the this squarely at this intersection of technology and national security. You know, ultimately, the causes and the solutions to climate technology are or sorry to climate change are all technology. Uh, related. Um, you know, it's, it's our technology choices. Um, so, I mean, there's some direct national security effects. You know, Vicky uh, mentioned earlier the fact that climate change is helping to drive, you know, global conflict over water, for instance, and, and migration of populations. Um, climate change is leading to uh, increasing frequency and magnitude of natural disasters, right? Wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, and that is impacting both, um, you know, the the, the homeland, uh, as well as a lot of uh, national security operations overseas, military bases and things like that. Um, you can just imagine with the sea level rise, you know, by definition, pretty much every Navy base is on the shore <laughs> and is vulnerable to sea level rise, just as an example. Um, but it, it's it's broader than that. Um, you know, there's also um, uh, climate change is spurring a global competition for, you know, kind of control of the resources and technology that are involved in, in addressing it. Um, you know, this is, uh, I mean, I, I like to quote, uh, you know, that great uh, uh, capitalist Vladimir Lenin, who, you know, talked about the commanding heights of the economy. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that climate technology is going to be among those in the in the 22nd century, or sorry, 21st century. I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and all the resources that are being poured into, um, you know, developing climate technologies are spinning off all kinds of other innovations as well. And, and they're going to have you know, direct national security implications as well. So the batteries, for example, that are being, uh, improved batteries are being developed for electric vehicles are going to be useful for other kinds of, uh, of electrified and autonomous systems. Uh, you know, the sensors that are helping us to monitor and track climate change, uh, from space, uh, or from the, the, the oceans are going to have, you know, create data that's going to be useful for the national security community. Um, so there's lots of examples like that, these kinds of dual use innovations. It's kind of similar to the way that the, you know, the, the, Space race, for example, spun off everything from Tang to microprocessors. <laughs> That's right. It, and again, as I think sort of just uh, from to, to where we've been to where we are now, I, I think a lot of attention has been placed historically in climate, what was called clean tech and now it's called climate tech. A lot of, a lot of uh, innovation and research done in uh, alternative materials, you know, different sources of energy, uh, wind, solar became really big. Uh, we're now in a place where, as, as Victoria, you've, you very clearly stated, we're in a position where we're fortunate enough to think about, uh, other perspectives and the four buckets you mentioned to include things like mitigate. Hey, we should really keep track of what we're doing, where we're at, 
what we can do to mitigate and, and reduce the, the effects of what we currently have going on. Meanwhile, still thinking of cleaner alternatives and also thinking about um, how best to allocate uh, and, and bring to bear resources needed to come up with next generation technologies in this field. I, I tend to believe optimistically that we've got, we got ourselves here because of the things we've experienced in the past. We talked about resources a little earlier. I think that we can't have a conversation about resources without perhaps thinking of, uh, internationally as well. You know, the U.S. isn't the only player, as you as you uh, found in your research. Can you talk a little bit about uh, other nations, where they're at? Certainly, we, we know that from the stuff we've talked about before, that the U.S. is, uh, is, is, is doing rather well. But what about other countries? What are they doing? What are they doing well? Uh, and what are, how do we all stand to benefit uh, as society, perhaps? Yeah, so, so one of the you know, players that we've already perhaps mentioned, but if not, uh, the big one is China. Um, and, and so tackling climate change and becoming a geopolitical leader in this space is one of uh, China's top political, um, you know, it, it's on their political agenda, um, certainly. And uh, to kind of put numbers behind this, they've actually outspent the U.S., nearly two to one on energy transition related investments between 2010 and 2020. Um, and on top of that, they not too long ago in, in 2021 launched a domestic emissions trading scheme um, that's now the world's largest carbon market. So they are, you know, on pace to, well, they're on, uh, yeah, they're, they're basically going to outpace um, the U.S. at like at this rate. Um, and, you know, Additionally, uh, in terms of the actual production of clean energy technologies, uh, I think it's additionally pretty well known that they are the like global leaders right now in solar panel manufacture, wind turbine manufacture, certainly battery uh, pack manufacture. Um, and then furthermore, they're the ones that are mining and refining um, a great deal of the minerals that are needed to go into these various materials. So. Um, yeah, it's very clear that they are a key, let's say, competitor to the United States um, when it comes to developing and, and um, deploying these technologies. Yeah, maybe I can add to that. I mean, you know, the one the one area where I think the U.S. has really got a clear lead, at least for the moment, is in innovation, actually. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of combed through the databases and um, compiled the, you know, the, the venture capital investment in climate technology companies over the last five or six years. Um, about half of it went to companies in the United States, um, and then another quarter of it went to companies in China, um, and uh, nobody else even comes close. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the U.S. still has the the edge in terms of innovation, but uh, but you know, China is really uh, making a play for it. And you know, I think one of the things that we've seen, and uh, Victoria mentioned, you know, the China's dominance in manufacturing of things like batteries and solar panels. Um, that's all pretty much done with. Um, with technology that was acquired from, you know, U.S., European, and Japanese and Korean companies, um, but China, you know, the Chinese government is very intent on developing its own, you know, domestic uh, technology base and not being reliant on Western and imported technology in this uh, future. Does does the fact that we're talking about climate uh, technology warrant a different way of thinking around uh, the competitive landscape? Philosophical question. You know, whenever we're thinking about any other sort of commercialized industry, it really is like, well, who's going to race to make the most profits, be the most innovative, make the most money out of this? When we're talking about climate technology, is there is there a little bit of a relaxing around uh, sort of looking at the ultimate goal of, of being dominant by way of dollars or, or currency instead of thinking through, like, hey, you know, in this case, this, if this company dom if this country dominates, it's actually really good for all of us because the planet will, will be better off. Now, I realize yeah. that there's sort of certain proprietary things that, in, like, as in any, in any industry, perhaps the first to to bring to bear some sort of capability is better off financially as well. But I think that there tends to be, my opinion, I think that there tends to be residual benefit in this regard. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I look, I, I mean, that is completely fair. Um, you know, I mean, just as an example, uh, you know, the, the solar market has grown like uh, 10 times in the last decade. Um, a lot of that is thanks to, you know, Chinese companies making huge amounts of solar panels very cheaply. And that has benefited everybody. <laughs> um, and it will continue, you know, to the extent that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, you know, that, that does indeed benefit everybody. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that, you know, just, just like, um, you know, just like access and control of petroleum has been a, you know, a huge driver of geopolitics and national security. Um, 
for the entirety of the 20th century, you know, climate technology is going to play that role in the 21st century, right? I mean, we don't want to just replace our dependence on imported oil with a dependence on imported batteries and solar panels. <laughs> that, that doesn't really help. Um, and if, if the U.S. Uh, and our, you know, our allies are going to have strong, uh, you know, geopolitical positions, um, you know, they, they need to be able to access these technologies. And, and you know, there's a, a big element of, of uh, influence on the global stage that goes along with that. That makes sense. If uh, another another hypothetical question, if, uh, if 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 government is supposed to help, we've learned uh, time and time again that uh, capital intensive um, innovation requires support from not just private sector but also sort of uh, public policy and, and you know government funding, for example. Where is it that not just the U.S. government but all governments in general? What are some like truths that uh, hey, if we want this to be a successful um, endeavor, if we want the R and D coming out of these these entrepreneurs and these investments to be worthwhile and to actually stand a chance and make a difference in, in helping us reduce greenhouse gas emissions or capture and mitigate what we've currently done to the environment. How does government play a role in this uh, generally, just globally? And then perhaps we can dig into U.S., you know, your thoughts on the U.S. government specifically. I would say, like, obviously, um, we, we kind of talked about how technology is, you know, hopefully going to help us innovate out of this uh climate change dilemma, but at the end of the day, like policy does really matter. Um, so, you know, whether it's a, like tax credits or R&D financing or, um, you know, creating a, you know, I incentivizing things uh, to be deployed, I think that's hugely important. Um, you know, knowing that we have the technology to, you know, uh, become more energy efficient, uh, to, you know, stop releasing CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. Um, that's just one part of it. We also like very much do need to incentivize the deployment of these technologies. It's not good enough that they are sitting in a, you know, on the bench somewhere. Uh, they need to be out there in the world. And, and so I, you know, government absolutely has a, a role to play in that capacity, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add to that, uh, you know, the, I, I mentioned a minute ago the, the huge growth in the solar industry, for example. Um, you know, we in large part have to thank the Japanese and German governments for their willingness to subsidize the early uh, demand for solar power pretty heavily um, in order to really you know build up the scale and the technology base that has enabled us to to get to this point. Um, so that's a great example. Um, electric vehicles, same. I mean, uh, probably ten percent of all the light duty vehicles, cars and trucks sold around the world this year are going to be electric and either fully electric or, or a hybrid. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is thanks to supportive policies, uh, you know, rebates and, and um, uh, uh, fuel economy standards and emissions standards and, and um, uh, you know, support for charging networks and things like that that have been government driven. So um, and I think that's going to continue to be the case going forward. So there, there's there's some very big picture policies like cap and trade schemes or carbon taxes. And there are more targeted policies that support the development of particular technologies, you know, whether that's uh, tax credits or R&D funding or deployment incentives or rebates or, um, you know, portfolio standards and, and things like that. Those things have all been out there and they, they have been effective. So aside from so let, let's I want to talk a little bit about um, opportunities and challenges that that this that this domain offers uh, specifically the government. You know, when we again using uh, Victoria, your the, the four the four sort of lenses that you described earlier, we're talking observation and tracking, clean alternatives, resources, and then finally adaptation mitigation. How is it that these different these four different buckets provide challenges or opportunities for the for the government? So maybe we could start by just talking about things like uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also being able to track and properly mitigate. What is it that the government can do specifically in that context based on your study, based on the sort of the, the, the information and research that you've gathered thus far, at least. And I feel like there are a number of different reasons, like, you know, for better, or for worse, that the like government involvement, like really does need to happen in these technology spaces. I mean, like in terms of observation and tracking, um, I have, you know, hopefully listeners are familiar. Okay. COP26 happened 
quite recently, last year, um, and a number of governments um, sort of laid out their plans uh, and, and what they were going to do to contribute to reducing emissions um, and, and sort of like set a date, for example, like this is when, you know, China is going to be carbon neutral and like 2060 was the date that they've set for that. But ultimately, um, we do have to kind of understand uh, and, and track, you know, the, the contributions of these different countries in terms of, you know, reducing emissions. Did they actually, uh, were, were they actually like truthful in, in achieving, you know, what they set out to do? So um, being able to very accurately uh, track these, these things, I think is hugely important. Um, additionally, uh, I think there's a lot of fear over this concept of like geoengineering, for example, and, um, you know, if it's a if it's done unilaterally, like there's a single country who's decided that, like, we are going to spray aerosols into the atmosphere. Well, you know, at the end of the day, it isn't going to be localized over the, you know, the land space of this one country. So um, being able to to track ungoverned unilateral geoengineering is, I think, another thing that um, we have to have the capability of doing. Um, so, yeah, the. Uh, tracking is is hugely important and and will continue to be and and luckily it's something that you know the US government um has had a huge role in like since the early 2000s um but you know there's there's so much there's so much more to say like uh you know we we talked about um the critical mineral supply chain and and that's i think another area that you know the government absolutely needs to be Involved in. Um, I want to yeah. uh, talk just very briefly about geoengineering. Um, in in my research uh, before speaking with both of you, I, I came across this uh, this topic. It's very controversial. Uh, I read uh, just a quick abstract on on, the, on a study done in 2019 that talks about the pot potential efficacy of geoengineering techniques. Uh, and I very simplistically understood it to be, hey, you could actually manipulate the, the weather by putting stuff into the into the atmosphere, into the environment. Uh, things like you know. Uh, either preventing or inducing rainfall, things like blocking or allowing sunlight and UV rays, for example, a number of other things. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts. On this it seems real. It seems like the stuff of science fiction. But if either of you have a thought on, uh, you know, what what the state of reality is there truly, and how uh, how useful or, or or detrimental perhaps it may be, I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. There are a number of movies out there <laughs> that basically talk about um, how geoengineering can go wrong, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say as of today, um, there are countries, as you mentioned, that have done um, like rain cloud seeding. That's actually like not um, super ridiculous. China did it around the time that they held their first Olympics, right? To, get rid of the pollution in Beijing. Um, Israel does it on the regular, um, again, to induce uh, rainfall. Uh, but but in terms of like this albedo engineering, as you said, things like cloud brightening in order to um, reflect back heat into space um, in order to, again, uh, cool down, cool down the the atmosphere, I'd say on on large scale, that hasn't really been done. Uh, I think that there again are like small scale academic um, investigations of this, like a little bit of R and D. But but again, it's it's not uh, probably being done to the extent that that it should be. That like we would really be able to understand and maybe model out or project exactly what this would do on a on a global scale. Um, so I know that there are also some, you know, entrepreneurs out there like Bill Gates. He's a big uh, proponent of of studying what geoengineering um, could do. And frankly, you know, I'm sort of in agreement there. I think that we need to understand what the implications are of, you know, again, a country going ahead and, and trying to do this unilaterally um, and what those like outgrowth effects might be. So uh, if everything was you know, going to be able to be regulated and, and done on like a, a small scale, then like, yeah, I think that we should go ahead and actually do this. And, and there absolutely should be government involvement in, in overseeing this. Yeah. Maybe I'll just add to that. I mean, you know, there, there are, there are a lot of people who have kind of a moral objection to geoengineering who say like, okay, you know, the solution to, um, you know, we need to attack the root causes of 
the you know what what human activity is doing to the to the planet, not you know another intervention that could have other you know uh, unforeseen or unforeseeable implications down the road. Right? I mean, the, the climate is just so enormous and complex and not completely understood, even after you know decades of, of, uh, of research on it. That the people people are really, I think, are, are morally opposed to the idea of, of geoengineering as opposed to just you know stopping or reducing the emissions in the first place. Um, but you know, as, as Victoria says, I mean, it's not um, uh, it's not that well understood, and it probably does behoove us to at least do some more controlled R and D to understand uh, a little bit more about it before it's completely ruled out. It, you know, as opposed to maybe being a, a, a one of the tools in the toolbox. You know, what people are worried about, of course, is that we'll wind up, um, you know, doing geoengineering instead of, <laughs> uh, you know, addressing all the, the root causes. Um, that That's the key. Yeah, instead of mitigation. Absolutely. I would also just like to say that, like, I think that advocates of geoengineering would often say, well, haven't we already geoengineered our planet by virtue of burning fossil fuels? Yeah, right. Like, you, just, you know, <laughs> Exactly. Unintended geoengineering has already happened. Um, mm -hmm. That's a fair point. So. Yeah. And I mean, this is really the sort of thing where there's going to be need to be international cooperation. I mean, there is actually an international treaty about, um, uh, you know, that, that forbids the weaponization of things like cloud, cloud seeding to, you know, reduce rainfall in target countries or, on the other hand, induce flooding. Um, so that's, there's, there's some precedent there. that's actually been around for decades. <laughs> um, so there is some precedent there, but obviously it needs to be much more uh, comprehensive. That's really interesting. Uh, Victoria, Steve, we're approaching our time, but before we end, I wanted to get uh, your key takeaways for our listeners. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll see this, this part of the discussion by suggesting that after my conversation with you all today, I am more resolved in my optimism uh, around, around what this planet has in store. You know, it's certainly there's 85% of, of my understanding of this was all doom and gloom prior to our conversation. Uh, but I, I walk away now with a sense of hope and a sense of positivity associated with uh, the, the the intellect and collective power of mankind in uh, in, in creating an environment uh, that, that is both sustainable and pleasurable to live in. Uh, your thoughts and key takeaways specifically for our listeners. Yeah. So, I mean, I think from my perspective, uh, so, I mean, first of all, as we said before, you know, climate change is absolutely a core national security uh, issue. And uh, it's good to see that governments around the world are, you know, realizing this and taking and starting to take action. Um, and as I said before, you know, both the causes and potential solutions are functions of our technology choices as a society. So, um, you know, technology has a huge role to play in this whole thing. Um, you know, we need to have, uh, we need to improve our technology, but also we need to, uh, you know, we have the tools that we need to make a big dent in these things. And, you know, uh, so making investments and having supportive policies for deployment of the existing technology. Um, and that, that includes, you know, the, the, the manufacturing and resource base that's needed to, to do that um, are, are going to be key, um, and um, you know the, the we didn't talk too much about it, but the venture capital industry has again sat up and take notice. I mean, you know these are enormous markets. You know the, the oil and gas market alone is a ten billion mark, dollar market every day <laughs> of the year, three hundred sixty five days a year. It's it's just an enormous business, um, and you know when you get into other th sectors like food and transportation, they're of similar magnitude. So. Um, you know, there, there's clearly a huge market opportunity for innovative companies and, and the, the markets have responded. I mean, we, we um, uh, you know, these days, climate tech investing has, you know, it, it kind of went from being a billion, billion and a half a year a few years ago to now it's over $20 billion a year. Um, and the majority of that is still going to what, we, what we're calling clean alternatives, but we're seeing more and more going into adaptation and mitigation and observation and tracking and, and the resources bucket as well. Um, and the markets have really matured um, and grown. You know, we talked about the solar market, the wind market, the EV market. Um, you know, they're less dependent on, on government subsidies. Um, the costs are lower uh, and consumers are now increasingly willing to, willing to pay uh, a premium to be clean and green. Um, and there's, a, you know, there, there's just a, an ocean of, uh, of, of capital that is sloshing into these markets. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we've identified... Um, uh, $36 billion worth of VC funds uh, that have been raised in the last five years that are where wow. climate is a core part of their investment thesis. Um, there's another, you know, $45 billion plus of general VC funds that uh, are actively investing in the sector. And there are hundreds of billions of dollars more of, you know, money managed by institutional investors, you know, uh, uh, the fidelities and, and, uh, 
uh, key row prices, you know, the, the, the pension funds and endowments, the soft banks, the sovereign wealth funds, um, the private equity and, and hedge funds and so on that are all jumping on this bandwagon. So I think this is a great opportunity to really make a dent. Um, yeah, I, you know, a thousand percent echo everything Steve said. Um, I think that there is cause for optimism there, you know, as, as we mentioned kind of at the beginning, there's a huge amount of innovation that's being funneled into this space. That's also, um, you know, coupled with the amount of investment that's going into a lot of these companies, um, you know, now more than ever, you know, government agencies and, and governments, uh, you know, uh, holistically as entities are very supportive of, of doing something about climate change. Um, I would say my, my one, you know, uh, hesitancy about this is that ultimately like time is an issue. Um, you know, we only have a couple of decades left to, to really do something to, you know, hopefully, you know, halt things from getting substantially worse. So, um, time is of the essence and, and, um, you know, additionally, like it's, it's a, it's a people kind of game too. Like we need more people operating at every level, uh, in order to tackle this. And, um, I think that in some sense, the, the great resignation is also funneling itself into this climate challenge, which is, you know, really excellent. So more people working in this space, more people innovating in this space and more, more of these technologies being deployed in, in order to truly mitigate the effects of climate change. So cause for hope, I think. Victoria, Steve, it's been really cool talking to you. Ill place pun intended. To our audience, in case you want to learn more about the things we've discussed today, Steve and Victoria have put out a blog post uh, that, that summarizes their findings. We encourage you to check it out at iqt.org. Also encourage you to subscribe to this podcast in case you found today's conversation interesting. I would bet that you would find a lot of other conversations we have in our podcast to be interesting as well. Victoria, Steve, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Of note, by the time this podcast airs, Steve will have moved on from InQtel to a new job opportunity, and we wish him all the best. Thank you all. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.